Hey everyone, so today we are going to talk about servos. Ooh. Um, so one of the most common questions I get is, what is a good servo? And the only real correct answer to that I can think of is the least expensive one that gets the job done and doesn't break. So, you know, there, there you have it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, there, there is no right answer to that question. You know, they're all good if you, they perform within the specification that you need. Uh, I think a better question is more along the lines of how do you choose the correct servo for your application? And that's kind of what we're going to focus on today without getting too crazy technical about it. So the first step in figuring out what kind of servo you're going to use is what's going to fit in your application. Um, you know, what's going to fit inside your costume or the prop that it is you're trying to build. And so, you know, they come in a quarter scale, standard size, uh, you know, these micros, sub micros, you know, little tiny nano servos. You know, there's pretty much something available out there for every application uh, that you need size wise. Okay, so once you decide what's going to fit in there, you know, you've taken your measurements and, and you know what size range servo you're working with, your next choice comes down to analog or digital. And the basic differences between the two are analog tend to be less expensive, they tend to be quiet, and they draw less power than a digital servo. Digital servos are more expensive, they have faster response time, they have up to about three times the holding power of an analog servo. They're programmable, so you can program them for direction rotation, overload protection, uh, speed. Some of them you can slow them way down, which is really nice. But they use a lot more power and they are flipping noisy. So, you know, that's something to take into account. If you're building some kind of animatronic head and someone's going to be wearing a costume and they've got, you know, 15 servos in their head, if that thing's packed with a whole bunch of digital servos, they're not going to hear anything going on around them. It's going to be all kinds of noisy. Whether the servo is analog or digital, they're both constructed the same way. They both have a gear train. They both have a circuit board in it, and they both have a potentiometer for feedback. You know, there's no difference in the construction. The thing you want to look out for in the difference in construction are the types of gears. So you go from nylon, um, which right now, forget that. You know, uh, nylon gears, they're nice because they're quiet and they last a long time if they're not overloaded. Uh, they break really, really easy. The gears strip really easy. And then the output shaft that's actually holding the servo arm on there uh, in the nylon gear strips really super easy. Um, so I, I really don't recommend using them. You know, the only time you use a nylon geared servo in, in a proper costume is because you have to, or you just need something really super cheap. But in my experience, not worth the hassle. Um, next up from there you go to carbonite, which is kind of like a, a fiber reinforced gear, and those are pretty strong and they're pretty durable. And then metal gears. Metal gears are the strongest, they wear out the quickest, but really that's more of an issue for like RC cars and planes and stuff where the servo is like in constant use all the time. You know, if you're wearing a costume, you know, 10 times a year, you know, it's not like the thing's going to have hours and hours and hours and hours of use on it. So. Whenever possible, I say go Metal Gears. Um, they typically are either uh, titanium or they're like a metal resin composite on some of them, or they'll use stainless steel, and they're all real durable. They're a little bit noisier, but not that much. Um, and from there, when you look up spec sheets, and this is something I recommend people do, if you go to like to Servo City, they have a chart for all the servos they sell, they have charts for high tech and Futaba. I'm a big fan of high tech. I've been using them for like 20 years. They work great. Some people like Futaba, some people like Savox, Savox, I don't know how they pronounce it. Um, but uh, Futaba's got, or sorry, high tech's got some really great stuff going on right now. Um, so you look at the chart and then they list it in terms of power output at different voltages and then speed. Um, so the gear is the output shaft on that, you know, if you've got your gear train like so inside your servo, whatever, you know, that sits like this and then that's the casing and you've got your motor and potentiometer here with the output shaft here. 
the better quality motors will have ball bearings here and here to support that output shaft. And you've got a circuit board down there. Um, these definitely last a lot longer and they're a lot smoother than ones that have like a, a bushing or um, like the nylon geared ones, some don't have any bushing at all. It's just the, the actual output shaft against the case and those can wear out pretty quick. I really would try to avoid those. Uh, go for ball bearing servos if that's, if that's an option, definitely do it. Uh, you'll be happy you did later on. Because nothing sucks more than having to take a whole thing apart just to replace a servo. You know, I mean, if, if a servo costs five bucks more and has ball bearings, get the ball bearing servo. Just save yourself the hassle. So from there you go to different types of motors. So they have three pole brushed, five pole brushed, coreless and brushless. Brushless, that's like super high end, top of the line type stuff. Not really necessary. That's more like for high performance planes, cars, and that kind of stuff. Um, they're supposed to have a little bit better uh, uh, power consumption and stuff. It's supposed to be a little bit smoother. Haven't used any myself, so I really can't say. Coreless motors. Um, in a coreless motor, you have your magnets in the center, and then you have the copper winding that goes around it. And these are primarily developed for things like RC helicopters where you want a really, really fast response time. Now in animatronics, the only kind of thing I think you'd really, where that's gonna make a difference is if you're, say, doing something that has super fast eye blinks, you know, like you're making an animatronic squirrel or something like that, or where you need a, just a lightning fast response time. Other than that, whoop you do doesn't matter, you know. Um, same thing, three pole brushed, five pole brushed. The only difference is with these, instead of having the winding going around, you've got, there's your motor windings, like so. And then you've got, you know, magnets that go around it. Five pole just has five poles on the stator. Um, with these, five pole is going to be a little bit smoother than a three pole brushed. You know, the only time that's going to make a difference, like I said, if, if you're doing something that's, you're going for hyper realism, like you're making an animatronic baby, you know, which is super creepy, but you know, you want a really super smooth motion in that. That's the only time stuff like coreless and this and three pole or five pole versus three pole brush motors is going to make any difference at all. Rest of the time, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got an Iron Man suit and you're just, you know, having panels or something open. Well, the panel, it's only going to open from one position to the next. You know, it doesn't have to have that super smooth movement in between. It, it doesn't matter. The servo is only going to travel from one end point to the other end point. Like I said, if you're working on something where you're going for hyper realism, you want super smooth eyebrow motions or facial motions. If you're building, um, you know, some kind of animatronic creature, then yeah, it, it could make a little bit of a difference in, the, in those applications. Um, but typically that's when someone else is puppeteering it, you know, in, in costume stuff. That's going to be some of that's going to be controlled by the programming as much as it is by the type of motor that's in there. The next big thing in the construction of a servo is the control circuitry. That is what makes a servo an analog servo or a digital servo. Um, and with these, the, probably the most crucial thing is how fast the processor inside the servo is telling that motor to move. You know, how long, how fast from when it takes its input signal to when it's telling that servo to move. And with an analog servo, it's doing it about 50 times a second. And with a digital servo, it's doing it at 300 times a second. So essentially, the difference between the two is a digital servo is always on. You know, I mean, the minute you ask it to move, it moves. There's no hesitation whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. That's why it has so much holding power, and that's why it uses so much more battery power. You know, the power consumption on, on a digital servo is quite a bit higher than on an analog servo. Um, some of these analog servos, you know, maybe they'll pull, you know, one amp, you know, on, on the upper end, maybe one and a half. Some of the, the more powerful digital servos can pull like four or five amps, you know. So it's something to take into consideration when you're considering battery life. Um, you know, how long you're going to be at a convention, wearing a costume, do you want to be changing batteries all the time? Now, the big advantage 
um, with these is because of that holding power, if you're making something like animatronic wings, you may not be able to find an analog servo that'll even get the job done. Um, not without having some, you know, uh, type of gearbox or something like that that'll uh, multiply the power output of that servo and then it's going to move a lot slower. So that's the other difference <laughs> between the two is that digital servos are tend to be a lot quite a bit quicker than an analog servo. Um, and by that, you when you look at a spec sheet, you know, it'll tell you, you know, it says, okay, they'll give you different speeds. So the speed rating is, you know, 0.14 seconds to go 60 degrees or 0.11 to go 60 degrees at, you know, 6 volts versus 4.8 volts. Well, that's without any loading on it. And because these have so much more holding power, because they have so much more torque, as soon as you put power to it, these are gonna accelerate quicker than these will. So again, if you need something that has really fast, lightning fast movements, it's pretty tough to beat a digital servo in that regard. Stand over here and make it easier. So yeah, it's pretty tough to beat that. Um, if you take a digital servo and you put power on it, this is kind of what they call dead band. You put power on it and you try to move that output arm, you know, it doesn't even want to budge, not in the slightest. You know, it really, really wants to stay put. But like an analog one, you can really, you know, move it around quite a bit. Now you can adjust that uh, programming it, which is the other big feature of digital servos, is that using a programmer like this, you can change the dead band width, you can change the rotation of the servo, you can slow it down, um, which is really nice for some things when you want a really, like you're building a prop and you want a really slow, smooth movement. Um, you would have to do that uh, with an external control circuit in an analog one. You know, you wouldn't be able to slow, with it, slow it down just by putting normal inputs into it. You'd have to have some other kind of circuitry that's sending that signal to, that's processing the signal to control the servo. So, the big question is, how do you pick one for your application? Now, the, the big things are that I look for are speed and torque. You know, that, that's really what matters most. Provided this, the, you know, if you've got two standard size servos, you know, and you decide, yeah, this will fit where I need it to fit in here, but there's like 40 servos made, you know, how do you pick one that, that fits your application? And it's all based on speed and torque. Okay, so speed is listed as time in tenths of a second to reach 60 degrees of movement. So that output arm, you know, on your servo here, for that to rotate, 60 degrees takes, you know, 0.14 or 0.22 seconds, whatever. So that may be one limitation for your, for your project. Okay, so the servo output torque is rated in ounce inches for to live in the US or kilogram centimeters for the entire rest of the world. That's a discussion for another time. Um, what that means is when you talk about stall torque, and this is this is probably one of the most important things when picking out a servo. If it's rated in ounce inches, let's say your servo is rated at 50 ounce inches. Um, that means with a one inch long arm, 50 ounces is the amount of weight that it takes for that one inch long arm to stop moving. So that doesn't mean that it can lift 50 ounces. That's just right up to that point, it's going to stop moving. And that's really important because as that, as you approach the stall torque, your current consumption is going to go like this. You know, as you get closer to where that servo reaches its limits, it's going to pull more and more. This is your current. And this is your, that's your torque. Um, to the point where you can actually have a servo fry its controller board um, if you actually lock that motor up, if you stall it to the point where, you know, where it can't move, you know, that's what stalling it is. Um, that is a really bad thing. 
um, especially if you're using like lipo batteries. Uh, ask me how I know. So, um, <laughs> so what you want to do is, if you've got, let's say you've got uh, Iron Man helmet and your faceplate, you know you've got an arm that you're trying to. You know, here's your servo, there's an arm, and then your faceplate's going to be attached to this. And you want that faceplate to move up. And you've got a servo rated at, you know, 50 ounce inches. And let's say this is a 5 inch long arm. Well, it's probably too long, but let's just say it's a 5 inch long arm. Okay, that means that this has to weigh less than 10, ounce, or than 10 ounces. You know, at, at 10 ounces with the five inch long arm, that will stall the motor. So ideally, whatever the stall torque rating is on your servo, I typically don't want to go more than half of that. Um, you know, you want to keep the current consumption low on there. Um, okay, so here I've got a little setup that shows uh, We've got this logging multimeter here, and I'm measuring the current output, and I'm using my programmer to drive this servo. Oops, right here. And you can see the numbers on the meter jump around that's showing the current drain. Okay, now in normal, no load use, you know, it's going up to, you know, just around 100 milliamps, you know, maybe 200 if I move it really fast. But watch what happens when... I start to load that. You know, it's getting up to almost an amp there, and that's really right around the stall range. So it just goes up like crazy as soon as you start putting a heavy load on there. And it's really nice because I can log that right here. Whoops, I don't know if you can see that, but it's logging it right there on my phone. So. This is a really, really cool meter, by the way. So I'll be doing a review on this later. So, you know, that's why I'm saying it's really important to watch the torque numbers on servos. Um, that's probably the most difficult thing to try and figure out. You know, without putting some kind of load on here to see what it's actually going to do, you kind of have to calculate the weights and, and guess, you know, for lack of a better uh, method, you know, unless you have some kind of, you know, you can get those force meters that you can use, like the, for instance, if you're going to pull, you know, a servo arm down or something, but those are kind of expensive, uh, like in hundreds of dollars expensive. Um, but after you do a few projects, you kind of get a feel for how, what kind of load things are going to take. Um, the other thing when you're designing stuff is try to have as little friction in the mechanics as possible. Um, you know, anytime that servo has to overcome friction to get something to move, it puts a lot more load on the servo which again, then your current goes up like crazy, you get shorter battery life, and you risk burning out the servo motor. My personal belief is, whenever possible, you know, use analog servos. They're less expensive, they're quieter, um, but the reality is they are rapidly becoming a thing of the past. Uh, I suspect in the probably next five to 10 years, there won't be any more analog servos even manufactured. Everything's going digital. So the, Nice thing about the, some of the digital servos is that they go up to a 7.4 volt voltage rating, uh, which is really nice. If you're using like a 5 volt microcontroller, then you can use a 7.4 volt or 7.2 volt battery pack to power your servo and then step it down using a regulator and use 5 volts to power your microcontroller. Kind of slick. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, if you guys have any questions or anything, send a write a message or whatever in the forum and I'll try to answer everything as best as possible. That's it. See you guys next time.